Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host, Stephen, and today I'm speaking with Professor Martha Feldman. Professor Feldman is the Ferdinand Shevel Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Music and the College. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has served as president of the American Musicological Society, and is the author or editor of several books, the most recent of which is The Castrato, Reflections on Natures and Kinds. She's here today to talk to us about the many different places her research has taken her, her upcoming book project, and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Professor Feldman, welcome to the course. It's lovely to have you. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. We have uh, much to get to, but first, let's just get uh, some of the basics out of the way. Could you please tell us what your role is at UChicago and, and how you would describe that to someone who is maybe not an expert in your field? Well, I'm a musicologist. That's a very broad, overarching term for anyone who studies music and writes about it. Um, although it's often used for those who have a kind of historical accent in the work that they do, who are leaning into the historical project at the same time as it can involve any number of um, different kinds of practices and disciplinary orientations. I'm also an affiliated member in Romance Languages and Literatures and in uh, Gender Studies, and I'm on the committee for Theater and Performance Studies. My work ranges from a whole variety of vernacular uh, music practices that are mostly vocal, and but that's a big big bucket. And within that, I'm really doing a lot of different things, or I have been doing a lot of different things over a long period of time. I'm more of a a fox than a hedgehog in terms of the way I work, although I'm a <laughs> sort of a hedgehoggy fox. That is, I change fields a lot. I've changed uh, the kinds of uh, work, work that I do but I burrow in very deeply. Well, great. We, we certainly have a lot to cover. Did you always know that you would work in music in some capacity? Like, has that been obvious since, since you were little or, or not? Uh, in some way, I grew up in a family of five children. I was the second of the five. And, and I was kind of anointed the music one. Uh, in a family of visual artists. I don't really know why, although my mother claimed that I sang Happy Birthday in my crib when I was six months old. You can imagine what kind of a fantasy that was. But <laughs> nevertheless, I was given piano lessons and other kinds of lessons, and I listened to music with my father all the time, and I ended up going to a wonderful high school, public high school that was an academic magnet school and also had majors in music and art. Um, so for four years, I was a music major. When I left there, I was a guitarist, a classical guitarist. I ended up studying for two years in Greece. I went to many master classes around the world. And by the time I was almost 21, I went to college. And uh, then I thought I had to be on a very fast track. Uh, but I also realized that I wanted to I wanted to study music and not just practice many, many hours a day. I just wanted to learn more and more about music. It was a very naive way of moving into it, but then I went with it. Is that, I mean, it looks like that's a guitar uh, over your left shoulder, it is am I right? one of a number, yes. <laughs> Did you assume that you would be performing, that that was where your studies would take you? And, and like, how did you come upon the field of musicology? Well, I was performing as a sort of budding professional, I guess you could say, but um, there were some things that were dissuading me from that path, even as I was on it. And one was uh, that I had bad nerves and there weren't really solutions for that at the time. Now people take beta blockers and, you know, do all kinds of things. So that was one, but the I would say even the primary one was that I was kind of bored with practicing all day and I was sort of bored with the repertory. I wanted something else and something more. Um, and so it just was drawn to, uh, to some kind of study. It was sort of elusive because in those days, uh, musicology was a pretty positivistic 
enterprise. So when I went to graduate school, I actually submatriculated at Penn into the graduate program while I was in the undergraduate program. Actually, while I was a sophomore, I started taking graduate courses, thinking oh, that wow. I was way behind and I had to sort of put everything on a fast track. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of stunned to find out that there was a lot of structural analysis combined with sort of almost forensic work being done by musicologists, handwriting analysis of Bach manuscripts, watermark readings of papers in order to date them. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. So it was, I was kind of rescued by certain people coming to the program who, that, that, with whom I could really work hmm. on something of intellectual interest. You said you began graduate classes while still an undergrad. So did you actually begin, you didn't begin a de graduate degree while still an undergrad, right? Is yes, that, I did. That's uh, unusual even, even for the guests on this show. I, I started out by taking graduate courses when I was a sophomore and junior. And I think when I was a junior, I applied to submatriculate was the word that was used into the graduate program as an undergraduate. So I, I really had a foot in both programs. Um, and by the time I finished my undergraduate work, I had finished more than half of the graduate work. So for me, it was a way of speeding things up. I was working very, very hard. I was always working incredibly hard, I have to say, looking back, um, because I was, to be. I was supporting myself and I was also taking all these courses. And I had at the peak, I had 25 guitar students a week. So I was sort of spinning a lot of plates. Uh, I decided to focus on sort of the way that the, uh, vernacular language was codified in Italy and specifically in Venice um, and its relationship to the codification of a certain kind of vernacular music. And I could see that there had been great difficulty in figuring out how to do this because there weren't formal records of it. And this people had studied how, how to sort of crack that nut had been, to my mind, going around it, going about it the wrong way. They had been trying to find formal uh, records of academies, uh, salon gatherings, maybe anecdotes about salon gatherings, as well as reading literary treatises and musical treatises, etc., and looking at repertories. Uh, but I realized that precisely what it was about the this city culture in Venice where all this was happening uh, precisely what was what, what what was characteristic of it and endemic to it and crucial to it was avoiding any kind of formal constitution it was a much it was it, it, based on sort of courtly manners and graces and uh, sort of, you know sort of notion of civic culture that resisted that kind of formalization. So I started studying a whole range of different kinds of documents that were literary documents, um, uh, funny little you know, bizarre, often bizarre print forms of print book compilations that wouldn't even look like books to us nowadays, some manuscript letters, but a lot of stuff that was printed because early printing really got going on a sort of mass scale in Venice and basically piecing together fragments. And I really came to an understanding of how all this was working over a period of time. It's always taken me a long time to, that's what I mean by being a, a hedgehog. It's always taken me a long time to arrive at a large vision for a project and see it through. Well, yeah, I mean, that sounds like such a difficult undertaking and such a kind of nebulous thing to try to, I don't know, to define or, or just, you know, suss out. We typically save the advice, you know, what advice would you give uh, for later? But 
what advice would you have for someone you know who maybe has identified a project like that and and is questioning whether or not it's it's possible to um, to see it through to completion? Well, one piece of advice that I always give to young people and people starting out, and really anyone at any stage who wants to accomplish something difficult and major, is follow your passions and interests. Follow your passions and interests. Don't think that there's some model out there. And if you could just figure out what the right model is and hew to it, you'll get where you want to go. You are the one who is going to figure out where you need to go. And your intuitions matter a lot in that process. And what drives you matters. You have to have a sort of belief in yourself and your instincts, even at the same time as nothing out there may seem to be reassuring you that you have any right to feel confident <laughs> and to stride forward, you know, uh, but you have to have, you have to have that. It's sort of yeah. a sine qua non. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that's a great answer. Um, how, you know, where did, how did your interests and, and passions evolve from there? I mean, um, I, I know we don't have time to get into everything, but sort of summarize for me, like how it evolved between, between then and now. Well, at the same time I was, I was finishing up this book on Venice that came out in 1995 with California. Before it came out, I started working on opera in Italy in the 18th century. And I was particularly interested in a type of opera that goes under the not completely historical uh, rubric of um, opera seria, uh, serious opera. Uh, it wasn't mostly called that at the time. Um, it was called drama per musica, which just means drama for music. And um, I was interested in it because I thought it held a key to a vast range of issues that had to do with Italian culture social life and and political life and ideology but i didn't think that that had really been understood and i thought the way to understand it was in part through a concept of the event and a, and and looking at the practice of the event so what what kinds of things happened when these serious operas which existed by the thousands in all different polities in Italy, what happened when they were put under extraordinary kinds of pressure? One of them was, for example, um, the Great Famine in Naples in um, 1764. Others had to do with turning what had been a more sovereign state into a, a more democratic state, and so on, a city-state in this case. I felt that I'd I succeeded in that, but only through uh, studying many different situations that mm. had come under pressure of that kind. And part of what interested me was the charismatic position of the singers, hmm. because these were either king's theaters or they were the theaters of a kind of sovereign body. So it might have been a group of oligarchs. It might have been a sort of Republican society. So there are all these different polities and many different commercial theaters, but they have ties to sovereignty of different kinds. And I'm talking about not democratic sovereignty, but pre-democratic, early modern sovereignty. So the singers in that situation are the ones who are, in quotes, narrating uh, this story which is a kind of mythical story, but they are usurping the charisma of the sovereign in the process of doing so, because they're the ones who are attracting the attention of the audience, who are becoming stars in a burgeoning kind of mercantile, commercial sort of proto-capitalist environment. And therefore, if you want to understand sort of how sovereignty is actually negotiated, you also have to understand the position of the singers and the position of audience members in these theaters um, and, and also outside the theaters. That's how I got into studying castrati, these castrated male singers who existed in great numbers and who were the biggest stars, often playing princes. And that, that project broke off from my opera book and became a book on castrati 
there's so many follow-up questions that I would I would like to ask if, if we had more time because I mean this it's a really fascinating journey um uh I will say one one thing that we always uh, ask about is you know have you had to have you traveled for research etc I'm always a tiny bit skeptical of, of people whose interests just happen to mean that they have to spend tons of time in Italy um <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've spent tons of time in many places but but most more in Italy well, I have many reasons why I've spent much time abroad, and only some of them have to do with uh, this aspect of my work. But um, I, I will confess that uh, before I started my pro first project on Venice, I was sort of bedazzled by the idea that if I do this project, it could actually be in Venice a lot. Yeah. And then you find out that you're, ac you're actually working and you're doing the grimy work of getting up early and going to the library. And I would go to libraries from 8.30 in the morning until as late as 11 at night. I knew when all the libraries would be open and closed and on which days. And you're just working. And a lot of times it's not only hard and exhausting, but it's lonely. It's, it's quite solitary. So I think the fantasy that this is just, you know, a delightful way to live and you're going to have wonderful meals and sort of hang out with your friends and go to the opera or what have you is a little shy of the truth. But of course, mm -hmm. uh, I, I established strong bonds with the places where I worked. The sources that I used were dispersed all over. Well, yeah, I think, I think that's, that'll actually be great for, for some of our audience to hear. May I just ask, like, what are you working on right now? What are you interested in right now? Like, what, what, what are you currently pursuing and, and like, what's motivating you at this moment? Well, I'm just finishing up. I, I finished drafting a book on the period of the last castrato and the last castrati and the aftermath of that period in Rome. The castrati withdrew to Rome of necessity because they were removed basically from the stage, the operatic stage in 1830. They were effectively removed from many parts of Europe where they had acted on the stage, sung on the stage. Uh, and had to uh, work in Rome. And the, the, the whole castrato phenomenon was perpetuated in Rome by gathering boys from villages outside of Rome. When I was working on the last castrato um, in Rome, one of the things that happened was I encountered a base in the Sistine Chapel who was also a collector of modern documents, modern meaning mid 19th century to the present. Mm -hmm. He told me some things I didn't know. I didn't know that the last castrato had lived with a woman for a while. And I didn't know uh, that she had had a child. So huh. that interested me. And the next time I questions met him, arise, yeah, <laughs> questions arise. And the next time I met him, he told me that the castrato's effectively granddaughter had married Fellini's brother, the famous film director, Fellini's brother. That really interested me, but I was still working on the Castrato book and I was trying to reconstruct a genealogy of Castrato singing that went from the 18th century, more or less to the present day. So as time went by, I scratched around and I found out that Fellini's niece, who was the, the daughter of this particular brother, was living in Rome and I went to see her and her husband. I found out that she didn't know anything about her father's singing really because parents separated. She didn't remember him practicing, uh, but they started to tell me the story of the family. And they really wanted me to be kind of the preserver of memory for the family. And they even gave me the whole family archive, wow. which I now have and I'm going to uh, deposit in an institution fairly soon because I've recently finished drafting the book. Wow. Um, it's, uh, I mean, all of that basically because of one conversation or sort of like one, one meeting. That's really incredible. More or less. It turned out that the Castrato had married in 1896, this woman. Uh, they used to go to the opera. She had a baby uh, who was not his progeny, although he declared it as such to the municipal authorities. Sure. She abandoned them both, the castrato and the baby. The castrato raised the baby on his own as a single parent. But it's very 
complexly imbricated with the Fellini family. <laughs> There's so, so much more I wish I could ask, but um, we're, we're speaking now like pretty close to the end of, of the semester. But uh, what does your sort of day to day life uh, as a professor look? Um, you know, what are your day to day interactions with students like and um, what do you find fulfilling about it? And, and is there anything that you don't particularly enjoy? Well, there's some kinds of administrative work that nobody particularly enjoys. Sure. Uh, and it has to be done. It's part of, you know, being functional as opposed to dysfunctional and running a sound program and a sound institution. But I adore my students. I have so many brilliant students. And those are at least as much the undergraduate students. I mean, they're equally the undergraduate students. I just finished teaching opera across media, which is my signature course. The level of engagement, critical engagement by those students is just astounding. It's at such a high level. I feel that I always learn as much as I teach and that teaching is a form of learning, but it's very reciprocal because of this particular body of students. And then I have fabulous, uh, dissertation advisees and uh, students in my graduate seminars. I also just finished teaching a graduate seminar called Love and Song, which sounds on the face of it, some sort of ordinary. And the ver mm -hmm. that very ordinariness uh, drew me to it. I realized I had been writing about love and song for a long time in various contexts. And when I started to explore it, in order to make this seminar, it took me a year to do it. And I found so little of real value hmm. that thought about the relationship between love and song as if it was almost too banal and ordinary to bear the weight of any signage. So it was my pleasure to sort of bring these two things together and figure out what the relationships are in a variety of contexts. And the students helped me greatly in doing that. And we made a song archive together uh, that reflected on a whole variety of readings in different cases. Interesting. So this class is actually, and I should say, I, I can... I could see in your face how much fun this was, mm -hmm. <laughs> just as you're describing it. So th this this class involved actually compiling an archive? Um... Well, we, we made what we called an archive on a Google Sheet. And it was effectively an archive that reflected sort of our thinking and the different byways we took. Um, but of course, we also did all kinds of other things. And yeah, it was just wonderful. My wife is actually a jazz musician and um, a, a composer a pianist, a singer. And uh, when I told her I thought I would teach a seminar on love and song, she just burst out laughing as if, <laughs> hasn't that been done before? <laughs> and it ought to have been done before, but it hadn't been done in a way that I found satisfactory. And I think in the end, I convinced her of that, <laughs> which was an accomplishment because she's a very significant composer and has written many alternative love songs, let's say. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes, that's Thank that you. absolutely is an accomplishment. Um, we do have to wrap up shortly, but I guess I, I would just end by asking, um, are there any avenues that you are looking forward to exploring? Like any any ideas that, that you hope to pursue in the, the near to middle future? I know you're wrapping up a book right now, so that might be all you can think about. But yeah, just kind of what do you think is on the horizon? No, it's not all I can think about. I just barely and recently started uh, turning to Greek music and um, working with some Greek scholars. Um, there's an international sound and theory workshop in Northeast Greece that had a lot of traction for me last summer uh, when I went and I'm going back this summer. I wrote, I, I led one of the sessions and wrote a piece that related to memories that I have of Greece uh, from a long time ago when I moved there, but also Greek music of that time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep exploring and see where that goes, but I'm probably going to end up writing more about love and music in some way. I think it's, it's, it's something that needs to be written about. Behind me, I have a whole 
shelf of and more of things, but um, very few of them really put the two together in a meaningful way. So I think I can do it. Thank you, Professor Martha Feldman, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more, and thanks for listening.